Welcome to my talk about uh, translation and creative writing, in which I will answer the question, what would you do if you needed to translate Xiaoxuan prose fiction literary works? Should you be as literal as possible, or can you use your own imagination? In Mandarin, the questions would be, and my answer to both of these questions would be, uh, the more creative you can be, uh, the better your translation will be. So my name is Daryl Sturk, as you can see here at the bottom. And I teach uh, translation here at Lingnan University in Chinese. I'm called Shi Dai Lun, or sometimes uh, Shi Da Lun. One time, about 25 years ago, when I called my future wife, my future wife is over here on the right hand side, Joey, on the telephone in the days before smartphones, her mother took the call. And I said I was uh, Shi Dai Lun, and Wu Wei Huan Chi, the Mama Chi Ting Cheng, Shi Da Lun like this. Ten big wheels. Uh, and uh, 25 years later, my mother-in-law still calls me big wheel. And uh, my wife, daughter, and I uh, live in translation. My wife speaks Mandarin. My daughter speaks Cantonese. And I speak English. And we have to learn from uh, each other. So. When my daughter speaks Cantonese, I have to translate it into English to be able to understand it. So why am I sitting here today talking to you guys about translation and creative writing? Well, when I was a young boy, I always thought I was going to be a creative writer, a storyteller. But instead of becoming a storyteller, I became a translator after learning languages. I learned French in junior high school. I'm from Canada, so everyone in Canada has to learn English and French, Canada's two official languages. And sometimes we would do translations between French and English as a way of practicing or testing our French. Then in university, I took Middle English, which is English from about 600 years ago, and Middle English is quite a bit different from English as it's spoken today. So different that you have to translate it into modern or contemporary English to understand it. And on the translation test from Middle English to Modern English, I got the highest mark in the class. In the same year, I was 21 years old. I just took a course in Mandarin and we also had to do some basic Mandarin English uh, translation in that class. And again, I got the um, highest mark in the class. So I had this sense that uh, um, I was pretty good at uh, translation. After uh, university, I went to uh, Taiwan and I learned how to read by consulting a paper dictionary. Remember, these were the days before uh, smartphones. You had to look things up in a dictionary if you wanted to figure out what the character was. And I learned how to speak Chinese by uh, consulting with my future wife. And the rest is history. After I started down that road, uh, there was no one going back unless I wanted to start all over again. And uh, I wasn't willing to start all over again. I was having uh, too much fun as a translator. Um, back in, in those days, I was translating semiconductor documentation, semiconductors, Bandauti. I was also translating news releases from the Ministry of National Defense, Guovanbu de Xinwengao. I was also translating uh, advertisements for wrinkle reducing injections of Rodugan Duzu, uh, otherwise known as Botox. I translated all sorts of different things back in the day. And eventually, I was also translating works of creative writing, usually Xiaoshuo, usually uh, fiction. I still thought of being or becoming a creative writer myself, but maybe as a literary translator, I was already a kind of 
creative writer. What is creativity anyway, but making things a little bit different? Anytime you uh, translate anything, you have to make it uh, different from the original. Um, so translation is uh, therefore, by definition, uh, a kind of creative writing. So I would like to give you uh, an example of translation as creative writing. Um, and the example is the latest story I have been working on. The story is from Taiwan. Go to the next slide here. The story is from Taiwan, and it's a traditional story about the lives of the Taiyadzu, the Taiyal people in the olden days. Uh, Taiyadzu is one of Taiwan's uh, uh, indigenous minority uh, peoples. Now, in the olden days, the Taiyal people lived up in the mountains and they hunted wild boar, Yizhu, and they planted uh, millet, Xiaomi. And uh, they made up stories about how easy their lives uh, used to be. In fact, they never had to do any work at all. When they wanted to eat meat, a wild boar, Yizhu Yizhu, would give them a tuft of its hair, and then they put uh, the hair in a basket, and pretty soon the basket was full of meat. They put a single millet grain into the ground, and pretty soon they had enough food for the entire year. They put a single millet grain into the pot, and soon they had uh, enough millet for the entire family to eat dinner. So life was really, really good until uh, someone got greedy. Instead of accepting a tuft of hair from a wild boar, a hunter went out and killed uh, a wild boar. And of course, the wild boar got very angry, or his family got very angry. Instead of putting a single millet grain in the pot, a farmer dumped a heaping cup in the pot. So before then, nature had been very generous to human beings. After that, nature wasn't so generous anymore. The wild boar said, you greedy humans, you just take and take and take, and now you will have to give. And uh, the birds that flew over and ate all the extra millet, they said, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat and any Christians in the audience will recognize by the sweat of your brow, you will eat as being from the Bible at the end of the story of the Garden of Eden. And in fact, this story that I've just been telling you is a Taiwanese Taiyadzu version of the story of the Garden of Eden. So let's look at the translation of the story. I've got it in another document. So the title is um, Taiyadzu Shi Ri Senghua. I should note that uh, this is not my uh, translation. The translator is a comic book publisher. He wants to publish this story as uh, a comic book. And he asked me to comment on his translation. And so I did. And after I commented on his translation, he asked me to retranslate it. And I, I think I will. And um, here's uh, what I've uh, come up with uh, so far. First, starting with the, the title, he says, uh, the way things used to be. And uh, I wonder, what things is he talking about? I prefer life, the way life used to be, which is what it says in the original. Senghuo here is life. Then in the first line, there's a conflict in his translation between the Taiyal people and we. The Taiyal people is in third person, Di San Ren Cheng Dan Shu, or Fu Shu, Di San Ren Cheng Fu Shu. And then we is Di Yi Cheng, Di Yi Ren Ren Cheng Fu Shu. So uh, at the beginning, he starts off in third person or first, uh, third person, yes. He starts off in third person, and then he switches to uh, first person. So there's a conflict between uh, third person and first person. It would be much better if he made both 
first person, or both could be in uh, third person. At any rate, it should be consistent. Then in the next line, he switches to you, second person, satisfy all of your desires, still in second person. And I think that's all right to switch into second person in the next sentence, because it's like you are inviting the reader to imagine what life was like in the olden days. The next problem is how to translate Huan Yin and uh, Zhui Yi. And the way the translator translated these two words is just uh, nostalgic. And usually nostalgic is Huai uh, Jiu. So what's wrong with that? Well, it's a problem in the Chinese and in the English translation. Huan Yin and Zhui Yi is uh, kind of abstract. And uh, nostalgic is just as uh, abstract. Man to xiang de, it's hard to imagine. And so what I did is I imagined how a person is going to look when they get all emotional about the olden days, when they get uh, nostalgic. And so I changed nostalgic to misty-eyed. Misty-eyed is a way of uh, describing somebody who is crying in Zhong Yu. Ooh, the tears in your eyes are like a kind of uh, mist. So that's something that you can imagine seeing. You can imagine seeing a, a tile person uh, getting all misty-eyed about the olden days. And maybe you might get uh, a little bit misty-eyed when you're reading this. The rest of the sentence, when they think about their life back in the old times, is pretty good. And the next sentence, it was an easy life, starts off really well. But then he writes, you could effortlessly satisfy all of your needs. And effortlessly is also pretty abstract. And uh, I just decided to cut it. I could have translated it into something else. But as you will see, if you read the rest of the story, um, it becomes uh, crystal clear why their life was so good back in the olden days, why it was so easy and uh, effortless. So um, this next paragraph here explains why farming uh, used to be so uh, effortless. And I already told you the story. They would put uh, a single grain of uh, a millet in the ground, and there would be enough food for the entire year. They put a single grain of millet in the pot, and they would have uh, enough for the entire family to uh, eat dinner. And then the next few paragraphs are about what hunting used to be like. So talks about going into the, um, the mountains and then meeting with uh, uh, a wild boar, and the wild boar would give them uh, a, a piece of its tail or give them uh, just a little bit of its fur, and that would be enough to give them all the meat that they could possibly want to eat. And as I go along reviewing Shen Gao, Bang Zigeren Shen Gao, as I'm reviewing his translation, I'm looking for mistakes. And I found one here in this paragraph when he says, Dao le nong mang ji jie, ta, ta men, shi xin zao liao yi li sa xia de zong zi, cong xiao dao da, zhe ge ying gai shi, and he translated it, each person, whether young or old, would carefully cast a single seed in the soil. So now everybody in the family or everybody in the village is casting a millet seed, I don't think that's what it means. I think it's more like everyone, young or old, would help tend a seed that someone, maybe the ancestors, planted and that keeps on giving uh, food to them uh, year after year. And as I go along thinking about how this should be translated, I'm looking uh, for ways to make this story sound more like it's from the uh, olden days which will usually make it uh, sound better. So, um, hey, instead of carefully cast a seed, zong, carefully cast a seed, why don't we change this word into so? So is a more old-fashioned way of saying zong, 
And once you've changed sow a seed in the soil, you've got a rhyme because sow rhymes with grow. And if you have a rhyme like that, hey, they rhyme, it just sounds better. And then instead of the word harvest, we can substitute a more old fashioned way of saying harvest, which is reap. There's an old song, you're gonna reap just what you sow. Uh, and I think in Chinese it's zhong dou de dou. Uh, you're gonna reap just what you sow. So reap is a more old fashioned way of saying harvest. And once we change this into reap, it, we've got a near rhyme with yield and year. So it's just going to sound better. And so my final version is gonna be something like this. The ancestors gave them a seed to sow everyone, man and woman, young or old, would tend that seed to help it grow. Then when it came time to reap, that seed would yield more than enough grain to last an entire year. I think it, it's not, it's much better. Uh, and I hope uh, you agree. And so I keep going looking for uh, potential rhymes and I find that uh, the translator already put in some rhymes without intending to. So he goes up in the mountains and he meets a deer and the deer would let uh, the hunter cut off a piece of its ear. So we've got an, a rhyme on ear and deer. And then as a result, the, uh, the hunters and everyone in the village had as much meat as they could possibly want to eat. We've got another rhyme here. Uh, rhymes like this are entirely appropriate to this kind of uh, legendary story and are just going to make it uh, uh, sound better. Finally, at the end of this section, I found this line here that the translator didn't translate properly because he didn't use his imagination. He didn't let himself get creative. So the line is, uh, Taman to say, I think it's the, uh, the firewood or the trees. Taman zhou. Uh, and how did this uh, translator translate it? He said, if you needed firewood, it would come in through your window. So he translated part of this line, but he didn't translate all of it. He didn't translate this part at the end. And I think it would be a lot of fun to translate. Uh, and uh, it would be an opportunity for the translator to use his or her imagination and to uh, get creative. Um, so I wonder if anyone in the audience here, any one of the 28 people in the audience would like to give it a shot. How would you translate Bu Jing Zi Lai or Bu Fei Chui Hui Zi Li De? Anyone want to give it a try? If nobody, if you're shy and you, you, you don't want to share your translation with, uh, with us, uh, then I can just share uh, my own translation of the line. Does anyone want to share his or her translation of the last part of this line? It will come out of thin air. Wow, well, fantastic, Uns unsolicited, oh great, wonderful. It was unsolicited, wonderful, Rachel. You didn't have to ask for this uh, firewood to come up, to come in. Unsolicited gift that uh, just arrives on your doorstep. And then another student had a, an idea. What was your idea? It would come out of thin air. It would come out of thin air. That's wonderful too. Out of thin air is an idiom that we use in, in English. Um, when something happens extremely unexpectedly, it can be something bad or it can be something good. It's, it can be a good surprise. So I think this is entirely uh, appropriate here. Hey, what about the rest of this line? Buffet, um, Chui Hui What do you think he's talking about here? What, do, what, is, this, what is this all about? Buffet, Chui Hui Zi Li. Well, <laughs> My own theory um, 
is uh, that this is talking about uh, a fire that they would make in a fireplace or maybe in a stove. And uh, I don't know if you've um, ever met a fire in a stove in Hong Kong, but in Canada in the winter, it gets awfully cold. And we used to have to make uh, fires in the stove in the winter uh, in the days before we had uh, central heating. And if you make a fire in the stove, it will stay warm for a very long time, for hours on end, maybe eight hours on end. So in the morning, you wake up in the morning and the stove is still a little bit warm because inside the stove, there are hot coals or embers. And if you wanna start a new fire and you put in a new piece of firewood, it won't, all, it won't uh, always uh, start burning, but all you have to do is just blow on it. And when you blow on it, you give it oxygen and then the fire will uh, come up again and it will start burning the new firewood. So I think that's what he's talking about with buffet uh, shui You don't even have to blow on the hot coals to get the fire to come out. Uh, to come uh, up again, to start burning again. The firewood that came in um, to, through your window would light itself. That is how I would translate the rest of this line. The firewood would light itself. And so uh, how does my final version go? Let's just look down here. And that, this is how I would translate it, or this is my latest version. If you needed firewood, you didn't have to go into the forest. You didn't even have to ask. The firewood would just walk in your window and light itself. I think it's fun to imagine firewood walking around through the forest and then walking in to your window. I mean, it has to get to your window uh, somehow. There was no need to blow on the hot coals in the stove or in the fireplace the wood would uh, just light itself. All right, so now we have to, we've reached the end of the first section here. Now we have to go back to the beginning and talk a little bit about the structure, Jiego, about the structure of this story. This is the beginning. And I didn't talk about this the first time, but I'm gonna talk about it now. In the original, it says, Dai Gu Dai de Ho. And Xu Xiu is uh, all is also pretty abstract, and the translator translated into needs. So as the translator and as the reader, I'm as I'm asking myself, what needs is he talking about? What needs are we talking about? This is my uh, my next question to you guys. Does anyone have any idea what needs uh, the story is about? What needs uh, could the uh, this uh, tile person possibly be talking about? What needs are, are these that uh, were so easy uh, and effortless to satisfy back in the olden days? Any ideas? There's a story about millet, how easy it was to get all the millet you wanted. There was a story about uh, about uh, meat, how the wild boar would give you all the meat you could possibly eat. So um, millet and meat are two kinds of food. So I think that's the first kind of need that we're talking about here. The first, first kind of need is a, a need for food, but food isn't enough we also need uh, firewood to keep us warm. And you can also use uh, wood from the trees in the forest to build your house with. So f the firewood here doesn't just uh, stand for keeping you warm, it also uh, is uh, shelter. You need ha to find some shelter or build some shelter as a place to keep you warm. So in Chinese, these two, these two needs are wun and bao. One is uh, the warmth you get when you find a good shelter, and bow is uh, a, a, a full tummy when you get uh, enough to work, when you get enough to, re to eat, sorry. The problem in this story is that there is a lot. There are paragraphs and paragraphs about food and the way they used to satisfy their need for food, but there's not very much about shelter. 
there is only a single sentence about shelter and the set sentence was about the firewood. That's the one we just uh, translated at the end here. There's only this one sentence in the entire story about uh, fulfilling uh, the need for shelter. As a result, the, uh, the whole story is unbalanced. And um, to make the story more balanced, I've already put in, um, I've already added to this uh, sentence about uh, shelter. And I think I could add uh, a little bit more. And here's what I've, here's what I've added here. I'm going to restore the balance in this story between Wun and Bao, between food and shelter, by adding even more stuff about shelter. So here's what I've added. This is my creative addition or contribution to this story. When you needed a bed to lie down on, a tree would walk in and bend itself into the shape of a bed. When you needed a chair to sit down on, another tree would walk in and bend itself into the shape of a chair. Or maybe every family would have a pet tree that would change shape depending on uh, what they needed. If they, it was nighttime and they needed to go to sleep, then it would change into the shape of a bed. Uh, and during the day, it would change into a table and a set of chairs so that they could have, um, so they could have lunch. And it would kind of like uh, be a, a sofa bed and I wonder if, uh, if Ikea is already selling this kind of uh, sofa bed. But our story, even though I've added this uh, paragraph or these two paragraphs to our story about shelter, our story is still not balanced yet. Let's keep, uh, let's keep going. There's a story down here about a greedy farmer who puts too much millet in the pot and then all of these birds come and they uh, eat up all of the, the millet. And I've already told the story at the beginning uh, when we were in the PowerPoint slides. Then there's this other story. Then there's this other story about meat. Instead of accepting uh, a gift from uh, the wild boar in the forest, instead of uh, accepting a gift, from uh, the wild boar in the forest, this greedy hunter goes out into the forest and cuts off uh, a piece of uh, the uh, wild boar's meat or even kills a wild boar. So there are all these stories, again, about fulfilling the, um, the need for uh, food, but there's nothing about shelter. And I get all the way to the end of the story, and I'm, I'm waiting for the story about how um, they, uh, they had to leave the Garden of Eden and they had to start making their own, own shelter. I, I was waiting for the story that explained uh, why it was um, that they, uh, they lost that uh, um, old lifestyle when everything was easy and uh, effortless. Uh, but there's no such uh, story. I get to the end of the story. There's nothing here about shelter. So the story here is unbalanced. So uh, I've decided to uh, rebalance the story by being creative again, and I'm going to add uh, I'm going to add more about shelter. I already added a part about a tree that would change shapes like a sofa bed, depending on what time of day it was. And uh, at the end here, I'm going to add another story about a greedy man, another greedy man. And here's how the story goes so far. There was a greedy man who didn't want to wait for the firewood to walk in through the window. He didn't want to wait for a tree to change from a sofa to a bed or from a bed to a sofa. It took too long. It always takes uh, too long uh, to change your sofa bed into a, into a bed or into a sofa. I always forget how to do it. So what did this greedy man do? He went into the forest and he took his ax and he cut a tree down. And all of the trees in the forest, the uh, uh, mother and father and brothers and sisters of this poor tree that got cut down were very sad and very angry. And so they said, from now on, dot, 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 and I haven't finished the story yet, maybe you guys listening in the audience can help me finish this story. Let's go back to the PowerPoint.
So I hope I have illustrated the relationship between creative writing and uh, translation, and I hope I have made translation sound like fun. It's certainly fun for me. If it did sound like fun, and maybe you'd like to try uh, translating yourself, then go ahead. You don't have to wait until your teacher tells you to do it. You don't have to wait until you're taking a course in translation. You can just try having fun uh, translating yourself. When you have fun, you're going to use your imagination. You're going to be creative. And the more creative you can be, the better your translation is going to be. You might even want to consider taking a course in translation or even an entire degree. We have a degree program, a major in translation here at Lingnan University. If you're if you think it sounds like fun and you might want to even take an entire degree in translation, I might see you here at Lingnan University uh, sometime soon. So thank you very much. And I wonder if any of you have any questions. Um, yes, I want to raise a question. Who? OK, raise your question. Go ahead. So um, I think your translation is very creative and interesting, but I um, I have a concern that um, if you are talking about your standards of translations, do you think um, if you come to the faithfulness towards the original test and the creativities of translation, which one do you prefer more? Should I? Well, you? yes, that's a wonderful question. Um, there uh, are different goals in translation. Uh, faithfulness, Zhong Yuan Wen, is one important goal of uh, translation. But we also have to dai, now xin daya. Xin is important. Royal loyal to the to the original is important, but yao da dao, the audience. You have to reach uh, the audience. And uh, as a literary translator, I think that reaching the audience by being creative and improving the story is more important than um, the principle of uh, faithfulness. I know some people in the audience are going to be uh, doing their uh, final year projects in translation. And um, so uh, when you're doing your final year project, uh, you probably can't uh, add all these crazy uh, creative ideas that I added uh, to my story, or your professors are gonna ask, well, where did this come from? This isn't a translation, you're rewriting it. Um, so for your FYP, of course, uh, you do have to be uh, loyal to the original. But my own experience as uh, a practicing translator is that there is uh, um, there is a lot of freedom for a literary translator to add things or take things out in order to uh, improve the story and make the reading experience um, in the uh, the target language more enjoyable. And um, when you add in your own creative ideas like I, I do, uh, you, you have to get permission. I mean, you have to ask the writer, is it OK if I add all these things or if I uh, cut this out? Is it OK if I move things around, if I change the order? And usually, if the, the writer is uh, still alive, the the writer will say, OK, go ahead and, uh, and make those changes. I agree with you. I think it, uh, it would make it better. So if the writer gives you permission or the publisher or the literary agent, then I don't see why there's any problem if you go ahead and, uh, and add your own creative ideas. And I'd just like to end with a, a personal experience. I read um, an essay one time about Shen Songwen. Have you all heard of Shen Songwen? a famous writer from uh, the 1920s and 1930s in uh, China. And Shen Tongwen has been translated a number of times, at least five times. There are five different translations of uh, Shen Tongwen's most important stories in, um, in the 20th century. And uh, I met somebody, or I read an article by somebody that compared these different translations and what they found is that the earlier translations were better because the first translators that did this, these earlier translations cut things and added things and changed things and changed the order. They let themselves be creative. Later translators had this idea, Shen Tongwen is famous. He's a, 
he's a he's a major writer. I can't change anything. I had better be loyal to the original. And as a result, those um, those later translations just aren't as good. So I think too much loyalty to the original is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, another example is Chun Sang Chun Su, the uh, Japanese writer. Have you all heard of Haruki Murakami? Haruki Murakami. There was recently a book about Haruki Murakami uh, translations. And those translators did some crazy things to the original Japanese when they translated it into uh, English. They combined books together. They cut out entire chapters. They did a lot more. They were a lot creative uh, than I was when I was working on this story about uh, the Taiwanese, a tile version of the Garden of Eden. So um, I think that uh, um, the, end, the end here justifies the means. If it makes the story better, if it improves the story in translation, then go ahead and uh, be as creative as you want to be. I hope I have answered your question. Uh, maybe you have another question. Uh, Rachel, uh, I'll just read it out. I like your translation. It is ra rather musical and fun to read. As a translator, uh, it's a creative one. So how do you handle those who try to stifle your creativity or freedom in uh, your translation? Would you rather be a full-time literary translator or a full-time uh, translation studies academic? Which do you enjoy more? Well, there are a couple of, thank you, Rachel. There are a couple of translation, uh, a couple of uh, questions here. Um, I, I've had a couple of experiences where writers or editors or other translators just didn't let me be creative. They insisted on uh, a loyal translation, even a word by word uh, approach to uh, the original. And it really depends uh, what, why you're translating it and uh, um, who your audience is and uh, how the translation is going to be used. So in some cases, I was translating for an academic audience or an audience of students who were learning Mandarin. They were comparing the original Mandarin to the translation in English. They wanted to be able to use my English to understand uh, what the Mandarin, Mandarin was saying. So obviously, if that's the purpose of the, the translation, then you can't be creative. You have to translate it pretty uh, loyally and literally, uh, or your students, the students aren't going to be able to use it to, um, to learn Mandarin. And as for the question of which do I enjoy more, well, I enjoy both. I think I probably enjoy being a literary translator more, uh, but a full-time literary translator doesn't make very much money, <laughs> makes less money than a full-time uh, translation studies academic with a, a job at uh, Lingnan University. And uh, hey, I've got, uh, I've got my wife here and my daughter's under the, uh, the table here. I've got a family to feed, so uh, it would be more difficult for me to, to feed them uh, uh, just if I were a literary translator. And another question here from Venice Lauth. Thank you for your question. How do you improve your translation skills? Like how to make the translation more accurate? Sorry. Are there books? about translation uh, that you recommended, that you would recommend uh, for learners. Um, how to make the translation more accurate? Well, uh, I think that just depends on uh, experience and uh, your language abilities. Like Venice, if you are translating from uh, English uh, to Chinese, um, you have to understand what the English is saying. You have to understand exactly what the English is saying. And um, I find teaching translation here at, uh, at Lingnan or everywhere I've taught translation that often the students don't completely understand what they're reading. They don't have enough experience of reading. Their grasp of the English language is just not good enough for them to do an accurate translation. They couldn't do um, an accurate translation even if they wanted, although some students, I have to say, some students at Lingnan are very, very good. Um, to make your translation more accurate, you need to understand the, uh, the source text in English um, exactly. And then um, you have to work on your Chinese. I mean, you have to be able to express the same idea or the same images in Chinese. 
I can't help you um, express the same ideas or images in Chinese. My native language is, uh, is not uh, Chinese. Um, how to make your translation more accurate in addition to understanding the original, making sure your English is good enough for you to understand the original, you gotta make sure that your Chinese is good enough to express uh, the idea or the image in the original. And the only way you can do that again is by reading. Uh, read as much as you can in Chinese. Uh, everything that you can possibly think of to read, you can read everything from Zhuangzi and uh, uh, Kung Fu Zi and uh, all sorts of different Gu Wen and Tang Shi. And you can also read uh, contemporary novels in Chinese. You can even read magazines. You can read fashion magazines. Uh, you can read Cosmopolitan magazine in, uh, in Chinese uh, to give your sense, to give yourself a sense of all the different styles and all the different kinds of idioms that different people uh, use when they're talking in Chinese. Are there any books um, about translation that you recommend for learners? Yeah, there's a wonderful book. Thank you for ask, asking. There's a wonderful book by Valerie Palat. And the name of the book is called Thinking Chinese translation. And it's a kind of funny title for the book because it should be thinking about Chinese translation. But Valerie Palat took out the uh, uh, preposition there and just turned it into thinking Chinese translation. And the idea was that if you take out the preposition about, if you just think translation, you get closer to uh, the idea of translation than you otherwise would be. If you're thinking about translation, it's like you're far away from it and you're kind of circling uh, around translation. Without the preposition, just thinking Chinese translation, it's like you get up close uh, to translation so you can truly understand it. And in this book by Valerie Palat, she talks about all sorts of different kinds of translation. There's technical translation, there's uh, art translation, there's uh, advertising translation. Remember I talked about how I had to translate uh, Rodu Ganjun uh, documentation into English about how uh, to solve the problem of uh, Yue Wen uh, of wrinkles when you get older, uh, you get these injections of, of Botox. There's a lot of work to do uh, in advertising translation and also finance translation. And finally, literary translation, fiction, drama, and uh, poetry. So this is a really wonderful book. There's a lot of uh, food for thought and a lot of ideas about how you can improve your, uh, your translation skills. I hope I've, I've answered your question, Venice. Thank you for your two questions. Are there any other questions? Hi. Oh, thanks, Rachel. For high school students hoping to study translation in university, what would you suggest um, them to prepare themselves for? Uh, again, I would, uh, I would uh, just reiterate what I said before. The way to get better at translation is read, read, read. Read as much as possible in English. Read as much as possible in, um, in Chinese and read all sorts of different things. Don't just read high, uh, serious, classic literature, also read trashy literature, read um, novels about uh, uh, whatever, um, vampires or, or whatever it is. It can be, um, it can be silly too, or read uh, comedy, read uh, comic novels, read all sorts of different things uh, to learn about all the possibilities in the English language and uh, the, the Chinese language and start translating. <laughs> Don't wait until you're taking a course. Um, start right now. If you're interested in translation, if you're interested in being a literary translator uh, or a creative writer, then um, then just start right now. I think it's it's kind of like um, it's kind of like getting into to shape, getting fit. I mean, you can you can sign up for a class, an aerobics class. You can pay somebody to be your personal trainer. You can buy a membership at a gym. But you're not going to get any better if um, if you don't 
go and put in the time yourself and and just start exercising. The best way to get fit is to go exercise today and, and go exercise tomorrow and every day and make it a consistent uh, habit. Even if you take a class, even if you pay a personal trainer, I mean, even if you uh, have a, a gym membership, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get fit. The only way you're gonna get fit is, is by exercising yourself and putting in the time. The only way you're gonna prepare yourself for uh, a life in translation um, or a, a career as a, a creative writer is by, uh, is by translating and, uh, and by writing. So if you're interested in it, do it, do it today, do it after, um, after this uh, session ends. And my email address is at uh, shidai at gmail.com. This is my personal email. So if you guys have any other questions <laughs> I, or uh, just have something you would like to share with me, uh, I, I would be uh, glad to hear from you.